Please join me this morning. Open your Bibles to Luke, Gospel of Luke, chapter 15. We're going to be looking at verses 11 through 32. And here we have one of the most classic texts in all of Scripture, the well-known parable of the prodigal son. And it's interesting to note that the term prodigal, it's never used in this parable, but it is a fitting description of the younger of the two sons because prodigal means wasteful. This is why I believe so many of us gravitate towards this parable. You may not know too much about the Bible, but you've heard about this one. You've heard it in Sunday school or you read it for yourself. And there's something here that we can relate to. A life filled with sin, obviously. A life filled with regrets. A life where we have deeply wounded the ones that love us the most and have betrayed their kindness and love with apathy and rejection. But this is not the sad tale of a young man that failed to live up to his potential. That's what we, we want to look at it as. Like, man, I could have been this, I could have been that. And the prodigal is an example of a failure of a life unrealized. It's, it's just a life all filled with potential and you didn't do it. And so we turn it into, again, the American dream. I should have had money. I should have had that education. I should have had that career. I should have had that wife. That husband. But that's not what this is about. This is the story of you and me. Prodigals, wasteful, one and all. This is the story of men and women who love themselves and their sin more than the father that loves them. That's what it's about. This is you before God in his sovereign grace choosing to save you. This is you even as a child of God when you allow yourself to indulge in the temptations of the world and your own sinful flesh. So as we read these verses, I want you to see what you look like as a prodigal and how you respond to the love of your father. So this is a story about you and me. So let's read there beginning in verse 11. Jesus had prefaced this in chapter 15 with two other parables, all of them about finding something or someone that is lost. These are stories of him coming and seeking the lost, you and me, not the other way around. Again, this is always true of the love of God the Father. He's the one that loves you so much that he sent his son to die for your sins, for my sins, and not the other way around. It's not as though we have this inkling of goodness or that we're somehow just kind of testing the waters and then we go seeking after God. We, we really looked at that last week in Romans chapter 3. There's no one who understands. There's nobody that's good. There's no one that seeks. God is the great seeker. Because like any decent parent, when he sees that one of his little ones are astray, he's going to worry. He's going to do something about it. He's going to go looking for you. And that's really kind of what we see here as well. And so let's begin there in verse 11. And he said, there was a man who had two sons, And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between between them. Now, not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had, and he took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into the fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and he came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion. And he ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, 
Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring the fattened calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come. And your father has killed the fatted calf. Because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you. I never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad. For this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. So this morning I want us to look at the two ways prodigals, you and me, how we respond to the love of God. And I believe that God put this parable in the scriptures to show us That God the Father is able and willing to love us despite our lack of love for him. He is able to love the unlovable. And that really defines who we are, lost in our sins. We are unlovable. Many times throughout scripture, it refers to us as the enemies of God, as children of wrath. And so we're not his friends naturally. If you were here last Sunday, you understood that perfectly, how we inherited that sinful nature from Adam and Eve, and that we have this this bent, this natural bent to sin. It's not that we sin and then we become sinful, it's we are sinners, according to Psalm 51, verse 5. We are born sinful, therefore we sin and are at odds with God the Father. And yet, despite that, he has this incredible capacity to love you and me, the unlovable. And so my intent here this morning is to enable you to realize God's unconditional, sacrificial love for you, and Lord willing, that you will find your way back home to him. So let's begin as we look at these two ways prodigals respond to the love of God the Father. Beginning there in verse 11 and 12, we find out, first of all, that the prodigal rejects God's love. You and I, in our natural state, you may not think it, but you're going to discover here real quickly, we're just like the prodigal, and you reject the love of God. Look at what it says in verse 11 or 12. And he said, there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Now, it's significant that the prodigal is the younger of the two sons, because according to Deuteronomy 21 verse 17, and I'm paraphrasing here, it says this, the firstborn son is to be given a double portion of all that his father has, for he is the first fruits of his strength. The right of the firstborn is his. This is why in Genesis 25 we see Jacob deceiving Esau and his father Isaac, all in order to get his hands on the birthright, a double portion of everything his father owned. But here's what's different about the young prodigal. He's not trying to scam his father out of anything. In fact, I think he does something far worse, or at the very least, just as sinful. He goes directly to his father, who's obviously not dead, and we have no indication that he's ill or near death, you know, which might cause him to like, well, I better do this thing, you know, and tell everybody who's getting what. No, he's not like that at all. No, he speaks directly to his alive and well father, and he says, give me the share of property that is coming to me now. Now, you need to understand that culturally, this was the equivalent of him saying, I wish you were dead right now so that I could have everything that you owe me. Could you imagine those words coming out of your son's mouth? I hate to say it, some of us, we've we've not, not only can we imagine it, we've had that happen, or we've been that son. 
All that kind of stuff come out of our mouth. But that's what the prodigal was saying. I want you to die so I can have all your stuff. I don't want to hear about your love for me, your concern for me. I don't care. I want your stuff and I want it now. And as if that wasn't bad enough, to add insult to injury, we find out that in verse 13, he then took his portion of what his father had saved up and he squandered it in reckless living. In other words, he took what his father had accumulated over his lifetime, presumably out of love for his sons, including this one, and he cashed it all in for wine, women, and whatever. And this was illegal according to the Jewish Mishnah, a book intended to help Jews know and understand the Old Testament law, which was in the works during our Lord's time. There it states, and I quote, if one assign in writing his estate to his son to become his after death, the father cannot sell it since it is conveyed to his son. And the son cannot sell it because it is under the father's control. In other words, he broke the law as well. His dad didn't turn him in. He could have told the elders in the community. They could have taken him out back and stoned him to death and got all of his stuff back. But God's love, it has nothing to do with stuff, things. Authentic love is always focused on relationships. You see? And so even though it was within the law for the father to turn his son in, we don't even see him doing that. But what we find in the heart of the prodigal, by his words and his actions, he essentially went about his life as though his father were already dead, right? He got his stuff as he demanded. A few days later, he must have sold it. He must have done something with it. He squandered it, and now we seeing, see him going to, to live recklessly, as it says there. And so we see the prodigal's rejection of his father and his father's love. I wish you're dead so that I can have what you owe me. Then he illegally sold his father's property, if you will, his father's expression of love for his son, and wasted it as though it meant nothing at all. What we're really seeing here is, is in the example of this prodigal is the rejection, first of all, not only of his love, but it begins with the rejection of the father's authority. It's like a professing Christian once told me, I don't want the church telling me what to do. Let me say that again. I don't want the church telling me what to do. Some of us we think that, you know, well, I'm spiritual. I believe that there's a God, but I hate man-made institutions. I hate religious institutions. Therefore, I want nothing to do with church. And yet this is the same church that Jesus laid down his life for and, and died for. This is the same church that he said that the gates of hell would not prevail against it. This is the same church that is entrusted with the word of God, the voice of God. I'm certainly not God. This church certainly isn't God. But this is his church that expresses, hopefully, when we're faithful to God's word, to to the text, this is when God is speaking to us. And so when we make those kind of general statements I hate church. I don't want to go to a church and be told what to do. Right there is the seed of, I don't really want God. It's not about the church. It's certainly not about me. What you're really getting at is, I don't want God telling me what to do. That right there is the heart of a prodigal, a wasted life. That is the first seed of it. And I know that's a hard pill for some of us to, you know, to swallow because, you know, that's where we're at. Hey, I believe in God. I'm spiritual. Don't give me any of that nonsense. You know, organized religion. All they want is your money and this and that and the other. And it's a scam. There's hypocrites there. Yeah, I've heard all of that. I used to say all of that. But when the church, those that are teaching, are preaching the word of God, we're hearing what he 
desires for us, his good, his loving will for us. And when it doesn't fit with the way we want to live, we start pointing fingers and calling names and abandoning the authority of God, not the church. Again, I know that this is some, uh, true of some of us here this morning because it's just good old sinful human nature. Some of you think God, much like the prodigal, some of you think God the Father owes you something as though you've done him a favor by gracing him with your presence. Well, I go to church from time to time. I believe in God. And then here's our demand to God. Now answer my prayers. Give me what I want, not later, but right now. And after that, you can die for all I care. And you know what? That's evident by the way we go about living our lives. You can die for all I care. You may not say that. But when you know right from wrong, in accordance with God's word, not your imagination, but when you know right from wrong because you've been exposed to the scriptures and you have a conscience and you have the conviction of the Holy Spirit and you know right and wrong and you choose to sin, what you're saying is, God, you're effectively dead for me because I know what's right and wrong and I know that I shouldn't be doing this, but I don't care. Do you see what I'm getting at? So what this all tells us is that the rejection of God's love, it begins with the rejection of his authority over you. Authority that is expressed in his word, in the preaching and the teaching of his word. Not just the imagination that you come up with. Well, I believe in God, and this is what I think God would think was best for me. Again, when you do that, where are you at? You're back at the garden, the serpent's whispering in your ear, saying, hey, the moment you bite into that, you get to be God for yourself, determining what's right and wrong for yourself. No, right and wrong is always determined, determined in the word, in the preaching and teaching of the word, and that's the authority that we're su supposed to submit underneath. Not a church, not an individual, but God himself. Now then, turn with me real quickly to John 14, verses 12 through 15. And actually, it, it begins in verse 13, I'm sorry. Because I want to suggest to you that this sense of, of de making demands of God and rejecting his authority and ultimately his love, it is easily seen. You can tell if you're doing that by the way you pray. And so here we have an example of prayer. And Jesus is teaching about it. John 14, beginning in verse 13, whatever you ask in my name, this I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Now, we totally misunderstand these two verses. We immediately think, well, I get to name it and claim it. I mean, he says anything and everything, and so I'm going to do just that. You know, so I can ask for anything from God, and he's supposed to be like Obama or something and just start handing it all over, you know, whatever you want. Cell phone, Lamborghini, I'm going to give you all that. Not even. There are conditions. First of all, in verse 13, whatever you ask, whatever you ask for, it, it must glorify the Father. That is, it must reveal his true nature and character in Christ. That's what the word glorify means. It reveals who God really is. So your prayers, whatever you're praying for, it should glorify, it should reveal who God truly is. Not just benefit you. So then, secondly, verse 14, we are told if we ask anything in the name of Christ, he will then answer your prayers. This is why everybody is like careful to say, in the name of Jesus, give me the Lamborghini, you know, whatever. And so we use the name of Christ like magic words. And, and that's not it at all. What he was talking about there was, was the character of his name, the power of his name. It must, whatever you pray for, whatever you ask for, it must conform to who Jesus is as expressed in his name, specifically Christ. He is prophet, he is priest, he is king, and so much more. 
And so that's the way our our prayers are supposed to look like. In other words, we must ask for godly things, things that reflect who God the Father is and God the Son are. The point is this, God doesn't owe you anything. He's already given you everything. The day his son went to the cross and died for your sins. This is what we fail to realize. That our greatest need has already been met. Redemption, salvation from an eternity in hell. These are the gifts that God is not waiting to give you. He's already given you. Over 2,000 years ago, that's what Jesus did. He went to the cross. Now, bear in mind, I'm talking about how the rejection of God's love begins when you reject his authority over you. Look at verse 15. Look at what he says there, all within the context of prayer, right? If you love me, you will keep my commandments. This is one of those verses like, man, I don't want to read that one. You know, anything but that. Because it sounds... Impossible, right? If you love me, and hey, everybody wants to be able to say that. I love God. I love Jesus. I prove it every day. But here he says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. No, bummer, man, because I can't do that. And by the way, here's here's not the loophole. There's no loophole here. There is a misunderstanding because immediately you disqualify yourself. You're going, well, then I cannot possibly ever love God because I can't keep His commandments, you all know that. Not unless you're fake, plastic. You're just lying to yourself. Nobody can keep all of his his commandments. You've sinned this morning. You're going to sin any second now. You've got a lot of sinning to do before the day's through. I'm sure it's going to happen in thought, word, or deed because nobody's perfect. So this word keep does not mean to keep it perfectly. What it does mean is that you will pursue him with everything that you got. You will guard his commandments. That's what this word really means. You will treasure his commandments. You will uphold them and know this is the word of God, his revealed will, his character, all expressed to me, and I'm going to keep it. I'm going to uphold it. I'm going to treasure it and guard it, and I'm going to keep my eye on it. I'm never going to... Keep it perfectly. But with all my heart, soul, and mind, I'm going to pursue God as he's revealed himself in his word. That's what it means. That's what it means to love God, by the way. Right? It's to look for him as he speaks, look for his face in his word, and there abide, there live, there pursue him with everything that you have, knowing you're going to fall flat on your face all the time. And that's okay. This is what children do. But instead of doing that, much like the prodigal, some of us, some of you, are all about, God, I love you. Now give me what I want and then leave me alone because I'm not going to even try and keep your word. Not in just mere obedience, but it means nothing to me. It means nothing to me because I have sin in my life that I know chapter and verse tells me is wrong, that you hate it, and I don't care. I just don't care. So we want God's blessings. We don't want him telling us what to do. I believe, I for one believe most of us are unaware of how similar we are to the prodigal in this respect. Rejecting his authority, which ultimately leads to the rejection of his love. We beg, we plead, demand, and expect God to give us what we want. And then we go about living our lives as though he were dead. Knowing what's biblically right and wrong and just ignoring it or rejecting it outright. And so that's what it looks like when you reject God's love. How many of us are guilty of that right now? Absolutely. So many of us, all of us. Again, I hate to say it, but that's how some of you are living and you know it. So what does your prayer life look like? What do your conversations of God, with God sound like? 
Do you go to him in faith and humility as a son or a daughter, trusting that he is a good and loving father? Or are you like the prodigal? I want all these things, and I want to live as though you don't exist and you have no power, no authority over me. And in essence, what you're saying is, don't tell me you love me, just give me what I want and go away. That right there is the heart of what it means to reject the love of God. But let me say this, God's love, the Father's love, is more than able to overcome your rejection. Like we're told in Ephesians 9 or 3, 19. There the Apostle Paul prayed, may you, may you experience the love of Christ. Though it is so great, you will never fully understand it. See, that's the thing with being a prodigal. You stay on the road long enough, far away enough, you begin to believe that he can, he can never love me. And you, you, you lose sight. You lose the capacity to understand how a father can love his child unconditionally, sacrificially, no matter what they do. For those of you that are parents, you have a different understanding. You have a different perspective because you know what it's like to love your children, to be broken over their sin, to warn them time and time again, and to give them rope, to just let them go, and it breaks your heart. And by the way, it happens from birth till 20-something. I'm probably still messing around my poor mom's heart, what have you. You see, it just never ends because love for your children never ends. And so for some of you, my prayer is that God would reveal his love for you even though you don't understand it. It doesn't make any sense to you. So if you're rejecting God's authority, you're rejecting his love. But his love is able, it's powerful to overcome your hate. Because folks, that's really what it comes down to. When you reject his authority, rejecting his love, making demands in your prayer life for stuff without any sense of keeping his word, treasuring it and striving to live it out out of love for a father, out of thankfulness for a father that loves you. When you reject all of that, really what you're doing is saying not I love you, it's I hate you. That's what it means to be a prodigal. Now then, secondly, the prodigal not only rejects his father's love, the prodigal replaces the father's love. Look at verse 13. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. Now the first thing we should notice is that the prodigal in some manner was you know, he's able to hit the road with everything that his father had given him. Maybe he sold some of it there and took part of it with him. We're not really told. But there's something very significant here about his destination. It says he took a journey into a far country. Now, of course, we're not told exactly where he went. But the fact that it was far away speaks volumes. He removed himself as far away, again, from his father's authority, his influence, and might I add, as far away from his love as humanly possible. You know, when I was a kid, I couldn't have been five or six. I decided that my parents didn't love me anymore. And who knows why I came to that conclusion at that age. Possibly, you know, my mom gave the last cookie or something to one of my little brothers and being the fat kid that I was, that was a big deal and that would have been enough to set me off. She doesn't love me. That was the last cookie and so I'm out. And so I remember, you know, uh, for some reason I must have seen something on TV. If you're going to run away and become a hobo, you're supposed to have a stick and a handkerchief and all your belongings, you know, tied up in it. And so I managed to rig one of those up and... Um, which, by the way, was filled with food, you know. <laughs> I do remember that. And so, you know, I lived in Bloomfield, and it was near the, the high school. That's where we lived. And so I remember making it as far as, like, the baseball field, which amounted to about 100 yards from my house. And, uh, you know, I didn't stay there, you know, very long or what have you. Like, the afternoon, you know, I didn't last too long. I ran out of food, probably cookies. <laughs> and so I came home, you know. 
And um, I don't even know if my mom to this day knows that I ran away. She probably just like, hey, you know, I was all brokenhearted again. But the point is, like the prodigal, I was running away from the authority and from the love of my parents. I dare say some of you even now are living in a faraway country, spiritually speaking. You've perhaps taken all that you can from God, and now you're on the run. But here's the thing. There's no such thing as a faraway country in the eyes of God. Turn with me real quickly to Psalm 139. I want to look at verses 7 through 12. Beautiful psalm. Psalm 139, beginning there in verse 7. We'll just make some comments, some running comments as we work through this real quickly. Here's what the psalmist says. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol or in hell, you are there. And so what this tells us is that even death, heaven or hell, it doesn't matter. Death itself cannot hide us from the presence of God. By the way, hell is not the absence of God. Hell is where God punishes those that have lived a life filled with sin and have not repented and trusted in Jesus Christ. It was originally made for Satan and demons, but it's also the abode of those of us who never trust in Christ for salvation. Verse 9 and 10, if I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. So no distance, no land, no matter how far remote is beyond the reach of God. And finally, verses 11 through 12, darkness itself provides no cover from the eyes of God. Darkness, even in the sense of sin... As though when we're in the act of sin, somehow God averts his eyes and he's blind to both you and your sins. Some of us have that mindset. When I'm engaged in the sin, God can't possibly look upon sin. That's not what that means. Whatever sin you habitually engage in, God is there. It's like a father standing next to his son as his son engages in all manner of sin. And so it says there, if I say surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day for darkness is as light with you. And so it's as the old saying goes, you can run, but you cannot hide. Our father is omnipresent. We are always in his presence. Now then, let's read back in our text, Luke 15, verse 13. There's no faraway country. Now look at what it says. Not many days later, the young, younger son gathered all that he had, and he took a journey into a far country, as far away from the authority and the love of his father, but he, he didn't really get far. And there, was, there he squandered his property in reckless living, Now, we don't use this word squandered that often, but it simply means that he wasted it. For example, I didn't know this, but according to recent studies, one out of every three lottery winners ends up flat broke within five years. Doesn't that make you feel a little better about not winning, right? Now, of course, we want to be that guy, right? Well, I want to beat the odds, and maybe I could be a cabillionaire for like six years, you know? Who cares? But the point is, he burnt right through his father's wealth like he had just won the lottery. Do you see what I mean? That's what he's telling us here. So what did all of daddy's money buy him, the prodigal? The second or last portion of verse 13, he squandered his property in what? Reckless living. Reckless living refers to the extravagant, the decadent. Why drive a Chevy when you can have a Lamborghini? Why eat a bland bowl of ramen noodles when you can uh, uh, dine on fine steak? So what does that look like? Look no further than Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. And again, I invite you to turn there. A lot of going back and forth, forgive me for that, but this is a good one to to dwell upon for yourself, to see with your own eyes. Solomon wrote these words, words that define what it means to pursue reckless living. 
So again, Ecclesiastes chapter 2, let me read these for you. I said in my heart, come now, I will test you with pleasure. Enjoy yourself. But behold, this was also vanity, meaning useless. I said of laughter, it, it is mad, and of pleasure, what use is it? I search with my heart how to cheer my body with wine, my heart still guiding me with wisdom, and how to lay hold on folly till I might see what was good for the children of man to do under heaven during the few days of their life. I made great works. I built houses and planted vineyards for myself. I made myself gardens and parks and planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made myself pools from which to water the forest of growing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had slaves who were born in my house. I had also great possessions of herds and flocks, more than any uh, who had been before me in Jerusalem. I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the treasure of kings and provinces. I got singers, both men and women, and many concubines, the delight of the children of man. Do you notice how in verse 1 he prefaced his summation, if you will, of reckless living? He said, enjoy yourself. Again, it echoes back to the idea of loving yourself, loving your sin more than God. And Solomon's sins, they revolved around drunkenness, which in our day and age would include drugs And so drunkenness, property, immeasurable wealth, the exploitation of people, especially women who he viewed merely as objects to be used. In the parable of the prodigal, we're only told that he squandered his father's wealth on reckless living. Only one time, as the eldest son describes it, on prostitutes are we told what that really meant, but I submit to you, at least in part, it also included all these things right here that Solomon indulged his reckless living in. And so the question is why? Why did this young man who had once lived under the umbrella of his father's love, his father's provision, why did he waste his entire inheritance on wine, women, and whatever? The easy and, in fact, correct answer is, of course, that he loved himself and he loved his sin far more than he loved his father. But I believe there's something else here. For instance, there's nothing wrong with owning property or being wealthy. There's nothing wrong with being attracted to the opposite sex, per se. Sin comes about when you love money or possessions more than you love God or when you are sexually promiscuous outside the confines of God's design, which is marriage between a man and a woman. And so although the prodigal loved himself and his sin more than his father, in the absence of his father's love, we also see him in vain, trying to replace his longing to be loved with all manner of sin. By the way, lost people do this all the time. Christians can do this as well. And so my question for you is this. What sin are you indulging in right now in order to replace the love of God? And again, this is for unbeliever and believer alike. What sin are you indulging in right now in order to replace the love of God? Ephesians 5.18 tells us this, do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, to be out of control, a loss of one's senses. By the way, this is why people do drugs. This is why people get drunk. It's because life, sometimes you can't cope with it. A lot of times you can't cope with it. And so this is the ultimate crutch, if you will. Because emotionally, perhaps even physically, spiritually, you cannot handle life. You can't do this or that. And so there's this indulgence of those things that would numb it, that would cause it to seem minimal. And so this is why I know I did drugs. This is why I drank to excess, was to numb all of those things so I didn't have to face them. And instead of being numb by it, what does it tell us what we should do? And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, this sense of numbness, out of control. But what is the alternative? Be filled with the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, who allows you to face circumstances and problems head on 
without having to go numb, without having to hide behind some kind of emotional wall, be filled with the Spirit, controlled by the Spirit, I know that this may be a shock for you, for, for some of you, you know, but I'll just say it. The first time I ever did drugs, I was five years old. My next door neighbor was my best friend, and he had siblings that were older than us, and we watched them all the time. We knew how to do drugs. They didn't let us do them, but we watched them, and then inevitably they were gone, but the drugs weren't. And so we just copied them. And so by the time I was 12 years old, when I was in junior high, uh, drugs were an everyday experience as long as I could afford them or so I could bum them off somebody. And so that was, that was my pursuit. That was, if you will, my God, because I found my comfort, I found my sense of peace, my sense of belonging, my sense of love, I found that within the confines of marijuana as a little kid. And I share that story, again, not to, you know, like, wow, man, you've come so far. Great for you, Tim. You know, you were a great sinner. No, none of that nonsense. It's to help those of you that have various types of addictions of your own to understand that you are missing something. It is the love of God that can bring about lasting, eternal peace, comfort, the ability to cope with the uncopable, if that's even a word, that's what you're missing. That's what you're sheltering yourself from by numbing yourself emotionally and otherwise. Then there's Proverbs chapter 5, 18 through 20, which speaks to the issue of authentic love between a man and a woman. Another example here. Let me read this for you. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife. You notice he says wife. The wife of your youth. Verse 19, I'm going to kind of skip over, and if you read there, you'll see why, because there's little ones here. The Bible's, well, the Bible's the Bible. And so then it says, be intoxicated always by her love. And that's a strong word. Now he's telling us, be drunk with her love. Be crazy about her. Verse 20, why should you be intoxicated, my son, with a forbidden woman and embrace the, bos the bosom of an adulteress. So then some of us, both men and women alike, have confused lust with love. And instead of waiting for the gift of marriage as God intended, you replace it with something otherwise. And you indulge that and you think that it's love and God has this perfect idea of what love is and I know, I know we come up with all these excuses. Well, financially, that doesn't make sense and therefore I can't get married because this would stop and these responsibilities, would it would cost us more and by the way, you know, things have changed, times have changed and so, you know, nobody does that anymore. God still does and, and it's good. I mean, there's studies that prove when we Rest there in marriage. Everything is better in the confinement. And, and we have this picture. No, it's not. You know, it's good to, you know, be with multiple people and to express our love and all these. No, man. All the things that you really want, and I'm just going to be crass here, you know, sexual satisfaction, all these things, Studies have proven, not just the Bible, they said it first, God said it first, but studies have proven it's all better within the confines of a lasting marriage. Plain and simple. No wonder the Bible says, be intoxicated with her. Look, I'm well aware that some of you are in the thick of this stuff. And now you're feeling all guilty and bad and like... I'm never coming back here, dude, because you're a loser. You said some mean stuff in the pulpit. It hurt me, so I don't like you. And so I know that you guys are in the thick of this stuff. And I don't, you know, I don't like, okay, uh, who's showing up? I'm going to beat him up with a hammer from the pulpit. I don't do that. But here's what I'm trying to share with you. You've replaced the eternal peace 
and the love found only in the love of God with all manner of addictive behaviors, alcoholism, drug abuse, pornography, promiscuity, and so much more. And perhaps you've even believed the lie, the lie that tells you it again and again, and you've probably heard just now, God will never forgive me, let alone love me. There's a road home for you, for all of us, a road back to the Father. Like the prodigal, you may have rejected his love, but that does not mean God has rejected you. Like the prodigal, you may have replaced his love, and you're living in that right now, but that does not mean you are unlovable or beyond the reach of your Father. Now, I want to end here, and I've read this following verse countless times from the pulpit. Now, I have no doubt that I'll quote it countless more because there simply isn't another verse in all of Scripture that sums up God's love for you as well as Romans 5.8. There it says, but God shows his love for us, for you, that while we were still sinners, while we were rejecting his love, saying, I want your stuff, but I don't want you having authority telling me what to do. When we've replaced his love, I'm going to live in this sin because I I need something that says I love you. I need some peace in my life. And so I'm going to indulge all of this sin and replace the love that you have for me. That's us. God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, still prodigals, wasting our life, Christ died for us. So your first step along the road back to the Father is to understand and to know and receive the love of God the Father. So how do you do that? Look at the last four words in Romans 5, 8 again. Christ died for us. How about you personalize that just for a moment? Look at it again, but instead insert the word me. Christ died for me. God's love is seen not in him answering every prayer and giving you all this stuff and you running far away. That's not love. God's love is seen in the cross. His son did what you and I could never do. He lived the sinless life. Out of love, in part, out of love for you. He can't do it. I'm going to do it for him. The prodigal cannot. He will not do it. Jesus said, I love you. I'm going to live a sinless life. Then he went to the cross with that sinless condition. He went to the cross and he said, I love you. I want your sins to be mine now. They are all mine. And I'm going to take the punishment for you. I'm going to take the beating, the crown of thorns, the nails. And I'm going to die on the cross for your sins. And God the Father is going to pour out all of the wrath, all the punishment that you deserve. And out of love, I'm going to take it. And so from the cross, what he's saying ultimately is, I love you. And then three days later, he walked away from the tomb. The tomb was empty. Not even death, not even death could restrain his love for you. And so in part, when the tomb opened, when he walked away victorious over sin and death, what he was saying is, I love you so much, I cannot stay dead. This is God's love for you, prodigal. This is where you need to rest. This is the walk. This is where you look. Not to yourself, not to vain promises. I'll be better. None of that. You're not going to be. Look to Christ and to Christ alone. Start walking home. Go back to your father through the cross. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you so much for your love. We don't understand it. I know some people here have given up hope. There's always hope. There's no sin that can separate us from your love. 
It doesn't matter how many times we've rejected you or how much stuff we've used to replace you. Your love abides. Again, it's seen in your son. Seen in Christ and him crucified. Seen in the empty tomb. There are some here this morning that need to come home. And so, Father, as, we about, as we're about to have just a time of, of reflection, I pray that some would do this. Instead of singing, instead of thinking about other matters, that they would realize that they're the prodigal. They're the one with the wasted life. And that they would repent of their sins in just a conversation with you. They don't need me to repeat some magic words. You're real, they're real, they can converse with you. And that they would repent of their sins. They would acknowledge that they're sinners. That's it. And then that they would trust in Christ. The Christ, not of their imagination, that allows them to define right and wrong for themselves or what it means to be loved or to love you. No, the Christ that we just talked about, the one that lived the sinless life, the one that went to the cross and died for their sins, the one that rose from the dead, the one that is fully God and fully man according to your word. And Father, they would trust in him alone, nothing else, and be saved by your sovereign grace this morning. I pray that those conversations happen here this morning and that you would save some. Now may you bless us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So just as I said, as we have our time of reflection here, some of you need to come home, you need to repent, you need to trust in Jesus Christ. And once you've done that, you need to tell one of us. It doesn't have to be formal. We don't demand you walk an aisle. We don't have an altar call like in some churches. It's just you and God and the Holy Spirit. But if God leads you back home this morning, you need to tell us. Not that it verifies it, not that we have any stipulations. We want to rejoice. Like next week when we hear of the Father rejoicing for the Son that comes home, we want to rejoice with you. You let us know. So you come as the Spirit leads you.